Hey, I'm Neoma Finn. September's been a rough month, I think, for all of us. To the right of the pond, they lost a beloved monarch. Yes, I know there are those who weren't so very fond of Queen Elizabeth. But even John Lydon, who famously wrote the words to God Save the Queen, the Sex Pistols version, not the anthem, admits to liking her. And this was the man who actually stated in the song, she ain't no human being. I, being a complete and utter Anglophile, watched those moments when her children, and later her grandchildren, stood vigil over her coffin with tear-filled eyes and wished I'd had the nerve to mail that letter I wrote to her back when I was 13. Ah, well. If I didn't have the nerve to write to Cary Grant or Roger Daltrey, I guess writing to the Queen of England was never going to happen. And now she's gone. So is Carrie, for that matter. Guess I'd better get busy with that letter to Roger. That aside, I want to extend my condolences to the people of the United Kingdom. Many of us on this side of the pond will miss her too. Closer to home, we also suffered a huge loss in the cryptid community. Most of you already know that Carrie Arnold was killed in an automobile accident in Texas on his way home to Mississippi. I didn't know him well. I was on his show a couple of times, and he was on D.A. Roberts' show back when I co-hosted it. We texted a few times and sent a few emails back and forth, and that was about it. Last summer, I chased him down at the Gatlinburg conference and got my picture with him. I got to meet his wife, Linda, that day. She is truly a lovely soul. My heart goes out to her. She was the perfect balance for Carrie, and as such, he was the perfect balance for her. Nothing will be the same for her from now on. I know you've been asked before, but please continue to keep her in your prayers. She's going to need all the support she can get for some time to come. For me personally, this has been an exceptionally stressful month, though nothing like losing a monarch or a beloved friend. When it comes to books, I know a lot about publishing them. I'm no expert, but I think it won't be long before I am. Most people have no idea what's involved in getting a book completed. Finishing the story is only the beginning. Next comes the editing process, then formatting and cover design, and then marketing. September, and August for that matter, has been a month of delays and miscommunications for each one of these steps until a book that should have been done and out by September 1st and that I finally accepted would be out on September 22nd, my mother's birthday, is at this moment still not published. I was absolutely certain the proofs on Monday would be the last, but I was wrong. However, I approved images today, and I'm going to be receiving a proof hopefully tomorrow, and then I can get that book out there. The problem lies in the cover art. Formatting the inside of the book was a cakewalk by comparison. Oh, I struggled with widows, runts, and orphans, but that was nothing. It just added a couple of hours of work to the overall format. Most independent authors ignore that fix anyway. However, the closer an independently published book comes to looking like it was put out by a major publishing house, the more likely bookstores, independent and chains alike, are to accept them on their shelves. So, making sure all the chapters began on the right-facing page, all the full pages measured exactly the same distance from the top and bottom edges of the paper, and fixing the widows and orphans and as many of the runs as I could was worth it to me. The cover, however, was a different story. I've never done a book cover before. Fortunately, my sister is an accomplished artist who did great work for me, and I have some level of skill with Adobe Photoshop, so we managed to come up with what I think is a pretty cool cover. That said, making the picture, adding the title text and author text, turning it into a PNG file, and sending it to the printer wasn't enough. It looked great in digital format once I realized I had to reset the DPI to 300. Yeah, don't ask. But the printed copy was too dark. I think I must have submitted the cover work six or seven times so far. By the way, God bless 48-hour books. They have the best customer service I have ever experienced. Keep your fingers crossed for me, please. And a little prayer would be greatly appreciated. Gosh, I hope you guys like this book. A lot of work has gone into it. 
Oh, and if that wasn't stressful enough, one of my granddaughters, my Mika, had to have knee surgery. She's 12 and she's already having her ACL, PCL, and MCL reconstructed. She's doing well now, but she's still in post-op pain. So keep her in your prayers too, if you would, please. So, this is why you haven't seen a lot of videos from me this month. Not that it's any different from any other month. As Roseanne Rosanna Dana would say, It's always something. If it's not one thing, it's something else. However, this being the beginning of my favorite time of year, I think it's time to get serious about my storytelling. So here goes. There's a creek in Robertson County, Tennessee, where I live, they call Car Creek. It cuts through the hills and hollers of this county with the unassuming meander of an old man out for a walk. A few years ago, it gained a little extra attention from the press when an exceptionally skilled beaver created a nearly perfect dam on it. But notoriety was old hat for this creek. It's been in the news a few times, not for its beauty, though it really is lovely, nor for flooding or drought or any of the other normal things you might expect to see in newspapers about the local waterways. No, Carr Creek appears in the news every now and then because of an inhabitant known to stalk its banks. They call it the Critter of Carr Creek. It was first seen decades ago by a farmer who will call James when he was out checking his cattle. It was a crisp autumn morning when James was out walking the pasture with his faithful dog at his side. He was checking the herd, calculating the quality and amount of forage available, and deciding whether or not he had enough hay put up for the coming winter. Deep in thought, he wasn't paying much attention to his surroundings. When his dog came to an abrupt stop a few yards ahead of him, he really didn't notice. He had other things on his mind. When the dog dropped his head and began to growl in the kind of low, threatening rumble dogs use to warn the world that they see something they don't like, James glanced up. His dog was facing the tree line a good fifty yards away. The pasture was a flax and gold, but the trees were only just beginning to turn, so the foliage was still pretty thick. James scanned the woods that surrounded the pasture, but he didn't see anything. What's up, boy? He asked the dog, who was now visibly shaking. The dog broke his growl with a quick, almost inaudible yelp. James looked back to the trees. Half a dozen head of cattle that were grouped not far from where the dog was looking suddenly bawled and kicked and trotted toward him. James, now shocked by the behavior of both the dog and the cows, squinted and searched, wondering what in the world had them all so spooked. Instinctively, his hands clenched and flexed as he thought of the rifle he left on the wall at home. A rabbit bolted across the pasture close enough he could have reached out and touched it if he'd wanted to. That wasn't normal behavior for a rabbit. They tend to run away from humans. Even as he was struggling to understand the strange actions of these animals, the feeling of being watched washed over him, leaving him with a sick, twisted knot in his stomach. That's when he saw it. James's mind raced through a mental encyclopedia of animals, but for the life of him, he couldn't identify what he was looking at. It stood on four legs and had a head not unlike a dog's. Its ears were short and penned like a Doberman's, but it looked almost as if it had a hump on its back similar to a buffalo's hump. He recognized immediately why he hadn't been able to see it before. Dark tiger stripes on its brown fur made it blend with the tall, spiky grasses and woodland plants around it. The only animal James could think of that came close to matching what he was looking at was the hyena. But hyenas live in Africa. Then the thing did something that made his dog tuck its tail and run. It stood up. Now I know that coyotes and wolves have been known to stand to get a better view, but this was different. This thing stood up like it was used to walking. James' blood turned to ice. Survival instincts kicked in and he turned and followed his dog across the pasture at a dead run. Prayers flooded his mind as unintelligible grunts and moans flew from his lips. He was afraid to look back. Was it following him? He had to know. Later, he recalled watching his dog jump the fence half a field away, but that was right before James looked back. 
After he looked over his shoulder, he couldn't say what happened. Had he climbed the fence, or did he jump it like the dog? Surely he hadn't taken the time to open the gate. The cattle were all gathered there. It would have taken forever to get through them. It was all a blur. One minute he was looking back over his shoulder as something monstrous was coming for him, and the next he was standing on the front porch of the farmhouse staring across the road at an open field that terminated into a small patch of woods where Carr Creek marked the farmer's property line. He was safe, he thought. Fear and panic erased all other thoughts. It would be years before James spoke of the incident to anyone. Not even his wife was aware of what happened that day. He never saw the thing again, nor did he ever go out to the pastures alone without his rifle again. It wasn't until he heard of others having seen it that he finally spoke up. Even then he said, Whoever would have believed me? Anyone who knew my dog would think I was a bald-faced liar if I told them he turned tail and run. He just wasn't the sort to do such a thing. James finally did tell his story when, not too far down the road, another farmer, who we'll call Martin, had his own experience with the creature several years later. Summer was simmering and threatening to boil, but a soft breeze blew across the county, carrying a hint of rain and the promise of a cool night. A half-moon hung low in a sky dusted with glittering stars fringed by the final remnants of daylight that was slowly receding behind the horizon. Martin, a hog farmer, was out at the hog lot that night trying to get his hogs to eat. It's one thing to make a brave dog run away, but stopping hogs from doing what they do best? Martin was walking around the open-sided pavilion and trying to solve the mystery of what could be wrong with those blasted pigs or maybe it was the feed, when he heard something moving in the bushes nearby. As the last rays of daylight sputtered and fizzled out, the world around the little homestead was swallowed in night. The security lights outside the barn cast feeble circles of light on the dirt and gravel that did little more than make Martin feel like he was playing a life-size game of connect the dots each night as he moved around completing the last of the day's chores. Now, as Martin studied his hogs and scratched his head, he heard a rustling in the bushes. He stopped and listened. He could tell it was a fairly large animal, but it was too dark to get a good look at it. In the back of his mind, he was thinking that thing out there might be what was disturbing the livestock, but there wasn't time to worry about that right now. He had bigger fish to fry. Then, out of the corner of his eye, something flashed. He thought it was some kind of large four-legged animal, but it moved so quickly, and he wasn't looking right at it, so he couldn't say. There had been a few rumors of something strange wandering around in the woods along Carr Creek, but no one had ever gotten a good look at it to describe what it was. Martin was no exception. He tried putting that blur of an object out of his mind. His pigs were his main concern at the moment. Turning back to his hogs, he was leaning in to scoop up a handful of grain so he could inspect it when a chilling howl pierced the night and brought him right back to a standing position. The howl itself was scary enough that it sounded like it was coming from just inside the tree line. It was terrifying. With wide eyes, Martin turned slowly to face the woods that he now felt were way too close to the barn. He searched for the source of the cry in the ink-black stain of woods. The two pendant lights that hung inside the open-sided barn did nothing to help him see beyond its perimeters. Martin had no choice but to rely on his ears. Cocking his head, he listened intently. Snuffles, grunts, and the occasional squeal from the animals pinned in behind him blocked out most other sounds, but he was sure he could hear a loud panting breath of something nearby something that was too close for comfort. Panic was building inside Martin's chest as he glanced up to the house and calculated how quickly he could reach it before whatever was out there breathing caught up with him. Then he looked around for some sort of weapon to protect himself with. He picked up a grain shovel, the only thing he could find, and took a long look around him at the black canvas of night before bolting first to the light that hung over the doors of the big barn where the grain, hay, and equipment were stored. Then he made a beeline to the old security light that stood on a single pole halfway between the big barn and the house. 
Reaching that, he stopped for a moment and leaned against the fuel tank that stood under the light. He was breathless now. Sheer terror sucked the air from his lungs. There was one more light in the yard, but it was over by the chicken coop, and he had no desire to head in that direction. It would take him farther from the house and closer to the woods. He looked over at it and swore he saw something moving somewhere on the perimeter of the meager halo. There was no more need for thought or planning. He broke into a dead run and headed straight for the side porch of his house where the lights from the kitchen meant safety. Martin, what on earth? His wife cried as he slammed the door and pressed his body against it. Martin didn't answer. He went over to the telephone and picked it up. There was no 911 service back then. He dialed zero for the operator. Give me the sheriff, he spat at the voice at the other end. Hurry! A second later, another voice said, Sheriff's office? And Martin blurted out that something was on his property, and he didn't know what it was, but it was keeping his hogs from eating, and they'd better send someone out right away. He almost hung up the phone before remembering to give them his name and address. The sheriff sent deputies, but they didn't find anything lurking in the dark shadows of night anywhere on Martin's farm. They did, however, find some rather peculiar footprints. They appeared to be of a large dog, a very large dog, with extremely long claws. A few weeks later, a married couple enjoying a 4th of July picnic on the creek away from the crowds and festivities in town returned from a walk to find the tablecloth where they'd had their lunch covered in muddy paw prints. The picnic basket was turned over. Plates were thrown about, and all of the meat left from their meal was gone. It wasn't long after this that some boys playing at Beach Bend Park in Bowling Green, Kentucky, shared a story of a hyena they'd seen and had tried to track. Bowling Green is a good 50 miles north of Carr Creek, but what else would look like a hyena in this part of the world? Imagine what could have happened if those boys had caught up with it. By late summer of 1966, stories abounded around Carr Creek. Livestock was being attacked, chicken coops were being raided, family pets were missing or found ripped apart and partially eaten, and the ominous howls that were coming from the woods around the creek were heard almost nightly. Brave volunteers gathered with each setting sun and combed the woods in search of the beast. Many of them reported something moving alongside them as they worked their way through the dense foliage, but none of them got a look at it. One hunter who took his dog into the woods on one of those nights turned them loose on a track. They sailed into the night, bawling their position as they made their way down toward the creek while the hunter stood with a group of men, proudly boasting of his dog's tracking skills. He'd no sooner got the words out of his mouth when the bawling turned to yelps and howls of pain. Three dogs went into the woods, but only two came back. A few weeks after that, a woman who lived near the creek saw something that she described as looking like a bear jump her pond and attack her dogs. It jumped her pond, not a fence, not a ditch. It jumped a pond. A man said he surprised an animal that looked something like a mountain lion. He didn't get a good look at it, but from where he was standing, he said it had short ears and prowled on four legs like a big cat searching for prey. Afraid he might be the intended victim, he didn't stick around to take notes. It got so bad that the authorities decided to launch an aerial search for the critter. Unfortunately, a weather front came through on the day it was planned and grounded the helicopter. Meanwhile, as fears continued to mount, theories became more outlandish. A local resident stationed at the U.S. Embassy in Burma wrote to the newspapers to suggest that the critter was a marsupial wolf. Strange as that may seem, such an animal is known to exist in Tasmania, so the man thought perhaps this is the American version of the animal, or perhaps the Tasmanian wolf had somehow hopped a boat and migrated to Tennessee. Things finally began to settle down by autumn of that year. It seemed like the critter had disappeared. Folks along Carr Creek turned their attention back to the more mundane aspects of life. Crops had to be harvested, tobacco needed to be cured, winter feed for livestock needed to be calculated and purchased if necessary. 
Thanksgiving was just around the corner and Christmas would soon follow. They forgot about the strange animal that looked like a bear or maybe a big cat or perhaps a dog and that the old timers called a booger. But was the critter really gone forever? Every couple of years or so, someone sits at the local feed store or grain elevator, sips on a cup of hot coffee, and trades stories with other customers. Yeah, I saw him jumping a fence in my back pasture, they'll say. I found some pretty strange paw prints along the creek when I was down there getting in some fishing last Sunday, someone else will add. Teenagers at the local high schools traveled the endless back roads in search of the thing, especially this time of year, when the thrill of the scare is everyone's main goal. It seems like it goes in two-year cycles, even years from what I can tell. And this is 2022. I suspect there will be at least one carload of kids who will get a little more than they bargained for one of these nights. Consider this. Adams, Tennessee, home of the infamous Bell Witch Cave, is located in Robertson County. Back in 1817, before anyone had ever heard of the Bell Witch, John Bell was out walking his land one day and saw a creature unlike any he'd ever seen before. He thought it might be a stray dog, and for reasons that probably made perfect sense to the frontier mentality of the early 19th century, He fired at it. The animal ran away. Not long after that, John Bell's sorrows began. Was his the first recorded sighting of the critter of Carr Creek? If that isn't enough for you, here's another thought. Springfield, Tennessee, where the creek empties into the Sulphur Fork, isn't much more than an hour's drive from the southern tip of the land between the lakes. Those who find themselves drawn to stories of dogmen and Bigfoot already know that it's the southern half of that national recreational area that hosts Bigfoot. But when I was there about a year ago, I saw something in the southern half that I may not have been able to fully identify, but that I am certain was not a Bigfoot. If you get a chance to visit Nashville someday, you should make the drive north to Greenbrier. Turn west on College Street and follow the road till it crosses the creek. It's an idyllic stream that rambles over rocks and through the woods, past graveyards and cow pastures, wraps itself around family farms and crosses under little bridges just like that one. Bring your camera. You're sure to get some breathtaking photos. And one of them just might hide a surprise. I'm Neoma Finn.